Hello, my name's Jonathan Gunter and I have been doing a PhD study for the previous uh, seven years which has been based in a Communities First area in South Wales. Um, Communities First was a community regeneration programme which launched in the year 2000 and I was a volunteer and I worked there and uh, over the following slides I'm going to explain to you the findings of my PhD thesis. So as I say Communities First was a initially a 10-year regeneration plan which was based in Wales's most deprived communities and that was based on the Wales Index of Multiple Deprivation which was a governmental index which monitored a range of um, uh, figures and issues uh, with regard to uh, poverty and social exclusion uh, within Wales. Um, so Communities First um, was um, <clears throat> reflective of a, a lot of policy of the era, um, triggered in the, the New Labour years um, since the New Labour came into power in 1997. And uh, in uh, England, there was the New Deal for Communities, which was a, a flagship regeneration programme which worked in which worked in many different areas across England. And in Wales, uh, Communities First was launched across 142 different areas of multiple di disadvantage. Um, as the years went on, this number extended to 179 different areas of multiple disadvantage. And um, <clears throat> basically, there would be teams um, that were employed by Communities First, which was a government-funded programme. Um, and these teams would um, often involve a coordinator, a development worker, and an administrator, sometimes more staff, and they would work within uh, an area, always based in that area, well at the start it was anyway, and they would um, <clears throat> develop partnership groups, um, and the idea would be that there were these partnerships that met up, that involved members of the statutory sector, members of the voluntary sector and members of the community sector, so members of the community. Uh, and they would form these partnerships and these partnerships would um, conduct audits of the needs of their area and through a process of um, kind of working towards these, these issues, they would seek to redress some of the issues of disadvantage and poverty within the areas that they, that they worked. And... Um, this uh, these these partnership groups um, <clears throat> I I studied um, I studied one in South Wales, and um, they um, they kind of they had the impact of well the intention of of working for <coughs> the benefit of these um, for of the, of the actual communities, um, and the idea would be that they bring statutory powers in and services. Um, the charitable sector uh, and also be able to bridge some of the gaps um, and link um, communities and services in a more joined up and effective way. Uh, so I looked at a particular partnership which was um, a, a subgroup of these local partnership groups uh, which was primarily concerning work with young people in an area of disadvantage which was the area that I worked and that was called the Youth Action Group, or YAG for short. And so the research question for my PhD thesis is what impact has the Communities First Partnership approach had on youth services and the lives of young people in areas of multiple disadvantage? Uh, I took an ethnographic approach um, and conducted participant observation and interviews. So um, I... Uh, attended the meetings for about 18 months. I'd actually been attending them for many uh, many years before that, um, when the actual group started in 2006. Um, but I attended 18 months uh, and recorded notes and recorded the audio of the Youth Action Group meetings. And I also conducted interviews with various partners that attended the meetings. So um, <clears throat> members of the statutory sector, some from the local authority, the council, some from the voluntary sector and some residents and community members. I also conducted participant observation of youth clubs in the area and as well as um, 
um, observing youth clubs, I conducted about six interviews with young people as well. So in this next slide, I would like to introduce to you and describe to you a little bit about the actual meetings themselves. Well, these uh, youth action group meetings took place once per month and generally they were about a two hour meeting. They usually take place on a Monday morning. Uh, it started at about 10 o'clock. And within those meetings, um, we may discuss things like funding, um, progress and updates. And there'll be external visitors from other um, organizations that may come along such as Network Rail, uh, the Prince's Trust and other third sector charities as well as regular members that attended as well and um <clears throat> yeah within within uh there, there would be discussion of um there was kind of like a, a general expected meeting schedule um that would start with a review of the previous um um well welcome and apologies a review of the previous month's minutes and then there would sometimes be uh discussion points regarding maybe upcoming uh, events such as Halloween events or the Christmas period or the summer period and different partners around the table would discuss what provision that they have in the area and it was a way of kind of joining up and discussing the provision <coughs> jointly in the area and what uh, delivery was taking place so that um, organizations were able to kind of draw on and maximize the chance of at least having some form of Halloween um uh, coverage during say evenings of antisocial behaviour uh, and fireworks night um, so that kind of things were covered and that services were being delivered effectively in the area um, or to as much as possible given the constraints of the resources available. So over the next uh, several slides I'm going to introduce you uh, the, the findings of my thesis um, and they will be broken down into three key areas. Firstly, I'll um, focus on the functions of the meetings. <clears throat> I'll then go on to explain about the impact of uh, the Youth Action Group uh, and these meetings on the area's networks. And following this, finally, I'll discuss the impact of the meetings and the impact of its networks on processes of marginalisation within the area. Okay, so firstly, in terms of um, focusing on the functions of the actual meetings themselves, uh, <clears throat> there were a number of different functions that the, the Youth Action Group could be seen to offer uh, for partners that attended those meetings. And one of those uh, examples would be um, support and advice. Uh, so partners could offer support um, and advice saying if there were difficulties with funding and things like that sometimes more experienced partners could get advice from less experienced partners um, those kind of from the the community sector that were running um, like clubs or you know local youth groups um, that maybe struggled with funding or struggle getting access to um, services could benefit from the the service providers that were there at the table because um, they could find out more about what could be delivered in the area. Um, on top of that, um, there was an opportunity for networking and information exchange. So getting information, as I say, about funding, networking, meeting others, uh, finding out about, say, substance misuse support agencies, um, uh, uh, getting to work programmes, um, organizations such as Careers Wales to direct young people towards uh, jobs so there was kind of that that level of crossover and opportunity to network different service providers um, with members of the community <clears throat> there was also opportunity to plan and manage the area services uh, for example um, there may be summer events coming up say if the youth action group was taking place in April and May or um, Halloween events taking place, or, or Christmas, and opportunities for, say, um, the discussion of making sure that there was provision in the area over the, the summer period so that young people weren't, say, bored or they had things to do o over the, the summer holidays, which would, of course, be good because it gave young people something to do, but also kind of um, helped to s provide a way 
uh, of um, not providing an opportunity for young people to congregate and gather and maybe cause nuisance behaviour because their, their their time is being fulfilled and uh, used um, in a positive uh, and creative way. Um, <clears throat> opportunity to manage the area services as well in terms of coordinating for um, say a Halloween event um, different organizations could kind of commit to different um, provisions that they're delivering and there would be an understanding between them of, of what's actually taking place at the time there was also opportunity to challenge other partners and raise concerns um, for example one time Tom who's a, a, a service provider um, from the, the the third sector the voluntary sector um, and he actually um, raised um, a complaint about a police officer that hadn't turned up to a summer event. They delivered this summer event and the police uh, weren't there. And so Tom raised it in the meeting. Uh, why on earth weren't the PCSOs there? To which they said that it was difficult because the, the Olympics were on in the centre and therefore it was difficult to get numbers there. But then in following events, uh, PCSO uh, presence at some of the events being delivered had increased. So it just goes to show how the Youth Action Group provided a almost like a, a safe place um, to um, raise challenges, a, a constructive place to raise challenges. Okay, so one of these examples above functions of the meetings being support. <clears throat> I've got a quotation here uh, taken during one of the meetings. Uh, Liam, who said, uh, I'm... He was a, a practitioner, um, say a fairly junior level practitioner, uh, was speaking to the group and said, I'm finding it difficult running the youth club. I've had problems with behaviour, young people smoking drugs in the toilets um, and there being difficulty kicking off, uh, to which Kathleen said, yes, um, Kathleen was the local authority um, youth worker that worked in the local authority youth center and she said yes it's hard i work with a lot of those kids you need to have patience and don't be afraid to show discipline for some of these kids a youth club is their first port of call for integration into society so they need to learn how to behave in the real world and really this idea from uh, kathleen that well she was providing advice to liam and all these uh, different partners around the table could not only learn about maybe the issues that service providers were, were, were having and therefore communities first staff may be able to bring support in or bring training to equip some of the, the more junior level or um, c leaders of community groups that might not have that backing that those with full-time roles did have. And also the opportunity for more experienced uh, partners and those with more formal backgrounds perhaps to be able to give advice and support. Okay, so I've explained a little bit about the impact of um, the, the YAG in terms of the functions of the YAG and what actually took place within the meetings, but now I'd like to go on and um, explain the impact of the, the, the meetings on the meetings, say outside of the meetings. So uh, I first explain, I take this first quote, which is from Communities First Development Worker Lauren, who said, a lot of the time we're in our little silos, but by bringing people together, you see you've got all the same issues and challenges. I know it sounds a bit cheesy, but we're like a family now with lots of really strong relationships. And really what Lauren is saying is that different partners used to kind of, whereas they used to operate in isolation and you may get leaders of community groups or leaders of the club and scout groups um, of various clubs and different organizations in the area that weren't really working together they were working in an isolated way um, there was definitely a, a step forward in terms of how um, partners work together uh, how different organizations could kind of operate and she she likened that to the process of being like a family uh, and that that process can be likened to what so uh, Putnam uh, refers to as social capital, and specifically bonding capital, which re re refers to in-group social ties. And certainly, being considered as a family, would could be likened to processes of bonding social capital. And also another point from John, who said the strength of the AG is that network. The work doesn't happen in the meetings. <coughs> It's a meeting, yeah, but most of the meeting happens outside of it. The group that comes together is just a mechanism to formally communicate and to have people in agreement around a table. But actually, the nuts and bolts of the work do not happen around that table. They happen with organisations emailing each other and working together. 
and um, this this point here from John is kind of explaining that <coughs> um, members of the of the YAG um, really the the YAG acted as a symbolic impact to bring partners together, but really the main work was outside of the meetings when they actually were more likely to say visit each other's venues uh, to work jointly on projects and different things like that, and so what happened in the meetings is it brought partners together but then that created a network of service providers outside of the meetings and the fact that it brought different partners together can be likened to processes of bridging social capital um which is something that robert putnam refers to and so we we, we see here we've got examples of both bonding and bridging social capital taking place so uh, building on this uh, idea of networks, um, I've uh, put together a network diagram of the services in the area before the Youth Action Group <coughs> in 2007. Um, and here this network diagram is um, shows mainly the services being delivered in Muddock, one area. Uh, there weren't really so many services delivered in other areas of the city. And um, there, there weren't so that that many, and that generally they were in Muddock. Now, uh, several years later, in 2012, 2013, which was the year of the field work, um, you can see that there's a, a, a greater number of services that were delivered. Now, some of these um, were actually organisations that were encouraged as a result of the increases in funding available due to Communities First and other organisations funding and supporting the growth of third sector voluntary sector um, youth organizations and organizations that delivered with crossover with young people but also other organizations yeah as I say that that delivered events that could also be attended by young people so communities first held the the local heroes awards uh, which was uh, an event which took place once a year but young people were open to to attend there were also lots of summer activity fun days uh, delivered in the area uh, and many different activities and things like that. <clears throat> so, there was a greater number of services delivered in the area, but in addition to that greater number, there's also uh, uh, a broader diversity of services delivered in the area, a broader diversity of organisations, uh, their backgrounds, say statutory, third sector, community groups, with a greater range of people delivering, um, and also um, a greater geographical, well, also in terms of diversity, a greater range of services being delivered. For example, uh, there would be <coughs> um, a general open, generic open youth clubs with, say, table tennis and pool. Um, and then there'd be more specific activities in other clubs, such as uh, sport clubs or music clubs for young people to pursue their interests and careers in music and recording studio activities um, and so what you can see here is because there was this overall net uh, of a wider diversity of organizations and wider diversity of people and the backgrounds they represented involved in the delivery of services there was a wider diversity of services and activities young people could become involved in wider diversity in the, the ethos and the makeup and the nature of these services and um, yeah just a just general addition to the the diversity there was also a wider geographical spread as as can be seen here um, which can be partly be understood by different organizations trying to find their niches in the area and to develop niches um, as they worked and also there was a greater connectedness between services which as um, the previous slide uh, previous two slides ago shows as a result um, of kind of partners meeting within the meetings they were more likely to work with each other outside of the meetings okay so the next slide uh, I would like to draw upon which looks at the, the unique roles of partners across the YAG network. So we've got this idea of like this youth action group network within the perceptions of different partners that had attended the group and were service providers in the area. 
and um, we've also got some perceptions from interview data of different partners unique roles within that network so voluntary youth worker and resident tom said where we have relied on communities first they have relied on us they need us to tell them what's going on they are one step removed they support us to do stuff in the community and they rely on us to tell them what the problems are we had a barbecue in the community garden and we invited our roma young people but we also invited their families and that was crucial information for them and so really what tom is saying here is that uh yes communities first uh offered uh support to us um frontline staff and practitioners but they were kind of one step removed from um, the, the links within the community. And this is where some of the residents who crossed over with being voluntary sector youth workers had uh, a real kind of unique uh, strength to add to the AG um, because they could actually engage with these harder reach groups because they had closer ties with them and spent more time there. And those uh, unique links, they could then use that to obtain information from this client group which then say more formal organizations from the local authority from communities first could act upon in order to steer funding um, to be able to um, better serve the needs of um, <clears throat> of uh, of residents of the area so um, going on to the next point now about um, communities first development worker Lauren we can turn this example on its head by saying not only were there unique strengths offered by those on the ground level to the youth action group, i.e. upwards, but also uh, there were those in more formal and statutory positions that could provide links to more formal and professional bodies that could be better for um, grassroots service providers and uh, young people and service receivers themselves. So the quote here from Lauren is that important people are more likely to come into the area and are more interested in providing funding. The National Theatre liked the sound of the things that Lakeside Youth Group were doing, and they said bring them down to a performance. Things like this are achieved through having conversations. So the more activity we do as communities first with people, and the more constant this is, the more other organisations will be, oh, we can help with this, or we have got more funding, how can we get involved? So really the point here Lauren is making is that um, they almost acted um, as advocates for the area and Communities First could have these different conversations with different staff in different areas and having those different conversations would serve as a way to kind of bring other uh, people um, about and kind of uh, bring other organisations with quite big opportunities um, into the area to direct funding. It's almost like joining up the gaps. And so really this idea of the, the YAG as a network the the ag could be seen as almost a part a kind of junction that brings different groups and different strengths of different connections together so we got this overall kind of entangling and mixing of different individuals and groups uh strengths from different sectors okay so um i'm now going to uh present the the next part of my uh talk um, we've all, we've we've spoken about number one, which was the the functions of the meetings and looking at the meetings and the, themselves what they serve to provide, and then we went on to look at the impact of the youth action group on networks in terms of different partners' perceptions of the youth action group as a network, uh, bringing different partners together, and also <coughs> um, that network existing outside of the confines of the meetings. We then went to have a look at the change in the number of services in the area and the expanded YAG network that uh, was kind of more diverse, greater in number, greater in connectedness and the net effect that that had in terms of the Youth Action Group being a junction with different partners within the Youth Action Group being able to offer different strengths uh, to that overall network in terms of what they could bring to the table. So next um i'm going to focus on the impact of the youth action group on young people themselves on the services and young people themselves but first i'd like to give you some examples of some of young people's uh processes of marginalization before i explain the impact of the youth action group on processes of marginalization as experienced by young people 
Okay, so firstly, <clears throat> Alyssa, who said, I was arrested and the police officers took me back to the station and were mean to me. I was crying and I was in a cell on my own and the police officer ripped a nail off my finger and said, if you don't shut up, I'll rip them all off. To which youth worker Ellie replied, <clears throat> surely you can complain about that because that's just not right. To which Alyssa then said, because my surname has a bad reputation with the police, she was being especially mean. And in Alyssa's perceptions, because uh, she was a well-known family in the area, um, <clears throat> that um, with a, a surname was well-known by police officers and different kind of uh, statutory roles, with maybe uncles and aunties that had gone in to prison and, and that, um, they maybe they, she Alyssa certainly felt that they expected her to be representative of that family. And she felt that that gave her a level of stigma that then went on to almost become a self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of that bad reputation affecting how she was treated by the police as well. Okay, so our next point um, is about a course that um, uh, some young people went to a university day on one day. And then there was a course going on over a few weeks. And I explained to the lads that that course was starting on Saturday. And were they up for it? It would look really good on their CV. One of them replied, where is it? I explained just up the road, uh, to which Charlie replied, yeah, but the thing is, Joff, you've got to understand those places aren't for people like us. And really, Charlie was getting the point across that even though a university was just a, a mile away from his house, he didn't feel that um, universities were supposed to be for people um, like him that came from that community. And really quite a strong point about you know the divisions in terms of what young people felt um, entitled to attend uh, the next point is um, from Sean who in a recording studio session said do you want to buy a Blackberry tablet um, <clears throat> the youth worker said um, uh, why would I um, want to buy a Blackberry tablet where did you get that from and he said oh I, I nicked them from the shopping center you just pull two tabs off of the back and um, you can sell them uh, to get trainers and smoke. And uh, <clears throat> the youth worker um, said, oh, you should find legitimate ways of getting money. To which Sean replied, yeah, right, like collecting Skittles or doing a paper round. And basically what Sean was saying is that um, there really wasn't a realistic way for him to legitimately get money because um, trainers and uh, small drugs... Um, are a lot more expensive than the money that he could legitimately be perceived to generate such as um, collecting skittles or doing a paper round and therefore he had no choice to, to turn to crime in order to be able to afford things like trainers. Okay, so now that I've um, conveyed some of these uh, points regarding the experiences of marginalisation that young people faced uh, in terms of their perceptions of uh, marginalisation, I'd now like to explain some counterpoints which can be surfaced from uh, the youth services that young people received and how I argue that the youth action group supported some of these challenges to these barriers. Okay, so firstly Alyssa, who said sometimes uh, with your friends in school you argue, but here it's a different kind of social circle, like you don't know any of them, so none of these people can judge you. Like they don't know your background and then you get to know each other and they get to understand where you're coming from. And uh, Alyssa here was describing a music club that she went to. And basically she, um, uh, th there was kind of the mainstream local authority youth services and um, they generally get the um, generic young people, the mainstream young people, like maybe the, the in-groups from the local high school that would go to that and there were these other clubs that existed that maybe other young people could kind of explore about maybe they didn't get on well with the friends um at some of the other youth clubs and find their own niches and Alyssa's saying that you know some of these clubs you could go to and because she didn't really know them um they didn't know her background and there was she was less likely to be judged by her background and that would almost give her a clean slate to which she could develop her personality without such a, a stigma of labelling. Okay, so the next point is from Connor, 
who said uh, we started coming here which was Lakeside uh, Youth Centre and doing music we did showcases and the thing we used to do with you you know by the tennis court and that show in the leisure centre with Gats and that's where we met Mike and he introduced us to Justin and his group then Justin introduced us to Kevin manager of a youth organisation in a neighbouring city and took us under his wing and then things picked up we were doing schools tours and shows in London <clears throat> and Connor's really conveying the fact that, well, he described it as a music scene and that even though they were youth services within an area um, such as Lakeside where they learnt about um, recording and learnt about uh, making their own raps and the things that my organisation used to deliver in terms of youth music events, um, they felt as if that there was a scene that they could attend to and be a part of and that led on to them finding some recording studio opportunities in Newport well in the nearby city and that led on to them becoming involved with Sky TV's Must Be The Music uh, and then going on to doing tours in London and uh, and different shows so um, just going to show in terms of Connor's perspective this kind of almost connectedness of different services in the area having an impact on young people's experiences could then lead almost on to stepping stones for young people to progress. Okay, another point from Paul. Uh, Paul was a young person that turned up to a youth club once a week. Uh, he had a go at DJing and learning how to DJ at the youth club. And he said he wouldn't have got a gig uh, unless he had come and did DJing. And then I found out about the trip Josh was putting on. And then when I got to know Josh, he found out about what I was doing and he asked me to DJ at the primary school. And so what Paul's saying here is that when he was at the club, he found out about a trip um, through Josh at Communities First. He went on the trip. Josh learned that he was DJing. And then he went to um, give Paul an opportunity to DJ in the local primary school. And so <clears throat> we've almost got this connection between one youth club and then a, a youth worker, well, um, a community's first development worker who was linked through there being this overall network of service provision in the area. And then on top of that, he could go on and uh, DJ. So there was these opportunities in other areas for him. Another similar point from Adam, who said, I think the first people outside of the youth club was Josh from Communities First. They were the next step up the ladder. When Josh came to a meeting with me, he said, like, Adam is a good lad and he has been doing this and has been doing that and working for Communities First and we're supporting him in the project. They just basically backed me up, if you know what I mean. I can't think of a way to word it. It's the same as having a letter of support. And what Adam's saying here is that... <clears throat> Um, really uh, the youth workers gave Adam uh, a level of support uh, and he appreciated that but he almost had like a, a perceived professional career pathway to which people outside of the youth act, uh, of the youth clubs as he perceived it were these kind of people in more professional roles such as the, the staff members of Communities First and as he got to know those um, he went to some meetings to to run an event and by him having an endorsement from these people in professional roles that did a lot for his confidence um, because it felt like he was having backup and uh, almost a, a letter of support is how he describes it uh, and so for Adam his perception is that <coughs> Um, this kind of link um, to um, this backup uh, was something that kind of strengthened him and really can be uh, countered with uh, the previous slides examples of say someone like Alyssa saying um, you know as a result of the background they were from they were treated unfairly um, here we've got someone uh, being treated with extra support because of where they're from, because of this youth action group network that exists. Uh, another example I'd like to provide is from um, Lauren, the de community's first development worker, who said different staff on different projects in different places shows young people they can have access to these different services too. It sets a precedent and breaks down barriers, like the YMCA project in Newtown and Muddock. <clears throat> So the YMCA project was uh, actually funded by the local authority youth service and the funding was received by the YMCA but it was to deliver these services within different place centres within the area. So one in uh, Willsmead and one in Plamwelly. 
and um <clears throat> for a long time it had been considered that uh there was this black bridge that linked um Planwelly and Muddock and that young people didn't really cross that that was a big thing to cross because there was no rivalry between young people in um Newtown and young people in Muddock and so <clears throat> this uh, project that delivered actually involved young people and youth workers that were delivering in the one play centre which was in Newtown uh, and it involves staff from the local authority youth centre Lakeside and also staff from YMCA and young people um, who had predominantly worked with the staff at Lakeside youth centre learnt that these staff were going to the YMCA and then they felt that they had the onus to go on and go over the Black Bridge to work in uh, the Newtown Play Centre and also young people that were going to provisions in Newtown with um, clubs that were speci specifically set up by Newtown Communities First in order to develop provision then found that there was um, the, the need for extra support because they could go to um, uh, lakeside and so young people who were only really ever turning up to Newtown felt that they had the confidence and opportunity to go on to, to lakeside communities first <clears throat> uh, and lakeside youth centre so we've got that overall crossing taking place and um, there isn't really known um, a division now that exists in the area so one 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 division that did exist before has fizzled out and you know that's been something like seven years now in the making okay so i'd like to explain another example of how the youth action group provided a network of stepping stones to support young people and uh this example involves the local uh roma young people uh, many families had moved in in 2003 and 2004 into the area as a result of European laws being relaxed on the numbers of Roma uh, uh, that could move um, uh, or the, the number of uh, borders um, and people crossing borders within Europe and the EU and um, there were increased um, numbers of Roma within the area <coughs> and um, they were very difficult to engage with as was considered by the local authority youth service and uh, on here the diagram U is where um, there was a, a music club set up and a lot of Roma actually turned up to that music club so um, they there was then a funded provision that was funded by the youth service um, which was delivered in um, Plan Welly um, and a lot of Roma went to that and um, that led to them going to another youth club which was delivered by the YMCA which is K and that um, led to them going on to f pursue some of them anyway pursue interest in music and go into an engaged club um, uh, in which they would work in music and recording studios and things like that to which they were other native local British um, young people Welsh young people as well as the Roma and so the fact that they were already hooked and engaged and had opportunities and activities to pursue meant that they um, got involved with those activities um, one young person in a survey from the provision in W said um, that they didn't like to go to Willsmead because they found that uh, the young people there were racist and started fights uh, but as A and Y and V show that young people actually went to these other provisions <coughs> um that the, there were basically summer fun days that were delivered and one fun day delivered in uh willsmead which was sponsored by network rail and a lot of young people from there actually went to those um youth clubs okay so i've i've explained a bit about the firstly the functions of the youth action group and I then went on to discuss the Youth Action Group in terms of its uh, impact on networks. And uh, following that, um, I went on to explain how the Youth Action Group network um, provided opportunities for progression for young people. Um, but now I'm going to start to bring the presentation to a close with some reflections on uh, really the the... The, the significance of these findings in relation to wider structural forces of inequality in society. Um, 
yes, the, the Youth Action Group might improve services, but what difference do that, does that improvement make to the lives of young people in areas of disadvantage? Well, uh, one, one particular source of um, research is Dale and Newman, 2008, who argue social capital may provide some counterweight to economic and social disadvantage. And there is a great deal of partnership work out there, also Balak and Taylor, 2010, who argue that social capital, um, you know, those processes of social capital will be able to kind of um, <clears throat> counter some of the negative effects of uh, area-based poverty that young people experience. And others, on the other hand, um, argue that uh, partnerships can ameliorate some of the negative consequences of poverty. Uh, but only changes to the working class base and foundational economy will achieve any meaningful impact on poverty in Wales. And so the the point here is that uh, Adam's saying that the foundational economy um, <clears throat> it really needs to change um, and that really partnerships can ameliorate some of the, the process of negative consequences of, of poverty but we need these wider level changes to take place in order to have any meaningful and significant impact on poverty which is a good point however um, this doesn't take away from the fact that there were many positive impacts uh, on um, young people and events held and accreditations delivered and engagements and many positive success stories and really, I'd like to bring the uh, the talk to a close with this understanding of kind of a comparison between macro and micro uh, understandings of the impact of services. Um, uh, because, yes, their structural inequality exists, but youth services can still be a valuable force for good in young people's lives. Partnerships such as the YAG can have a strong impact on the delivery of services, which can counter some processes of inequality so we need to move away from a dichotomous view of services towards a more nuanced understanding of their impact on networks at the community level we need to recognize that influencing these micro processes are integral to the wider picture so must not be undervalued and really the point here is that yes micro level processes such as partnerships as the youth action group can have impacts on people at the local level they can't kind of um, solve uh, the UK's uh, poverty issue. There's many, many wider complex issues at stake. However, they can have some tangible difference on the lives of young people and uh, uh, an impact on services. And so we need to look at them and understand services within that way because it's perhaps those little micro steps that can build towards... Uh, a macro picture and so I'd like to bring your attention to some of the, the things that can undermine the significance and impact of uh, the the youth action group over time um, such as adding other areas to the youth action group top-down changes which can undermine fragile networks that exist such as imposed by the local authority um, adding other areas to the group's remit um, resurfacing divisions so sometimes there would be a conflict that that came up one time, time between lakeside um, <coughs> communities uh, lakeside youth center and mud communities first and then the different staff were getting um, territorial with the young people that they work with um, one um, community member said it's not fair it's all gone up in the air uh, and it's not fair on the kids because they're miss missing out on services because the staff are becoming um, uh, territorial uh, and defensive over the, the people that, the, that they work with and the young people that they work with. And really over time, um, it's about understanding that the Youth Action Group is this network, like a delicate, fragile network, a junction of these different uh, community members um, and sectors of service provision that when when joined can have their most beneficial impact on ameliorating processes of poverty and providing opportunities for learning and understanding for young people's progression and development however naturally with policy changes at a um uh, uh, maybe 
your government, central government level. Uh, changes in terms of funding, environmental circumstances, and also changes over time regarding um, resurfacing divisions, changes over time with regard to austerity and fluctuations in government funds available and other environmental things, these connections become um, undermined. And obviously the, the great obvious one is that a young person uh, one year, 15 years later, isn't going to be the same young person. There'll be new young people in the area. And so there's this constant regeneration uh, and cycle of connections and networks that exist and so rather than looking at it as throwing the baby out with the bathwater, we should understand these network catalysts, as it were, that support networks that could be most conducive, conducive to strengthening services should not be regarded as something that um, are a failure because they don't overcome poverty, but instead they should be regarded as an entity that should be continually maintained and protected over time and over generations in order to maximize the gains that they can be regarded as successful in achieving. And that there is a strength in the finding of these networks that I argue we should not um, knowingly um, undermine and um, dismiss because um, coupled with other um, developments in services and wider policy interventions can be part of the builder box of building a stronger and more cohesive society. So I'd just like to thank you for listening to this talk and um, ask if you have any questions. Undermine and um, dismiss because um, coupled with other um, developments in services and wider policy interventions can be part of the builder box of building a stronger and more cohesive society. So I'd just like to thank you for listening to this talk and um, ask if you have any questions.